Cool. So hi everyone. I'm Maddie. Um, and my talk is a little bit, or I guess now I'll make it a discussion, is a little bit about, um, it's kind of sprung from a year or so thinking what can people in games, people who design them, who consume them, um, how are we to re uh, how are we to react to like what's going on in the world? Um, I can't imagine a group of people who feel most at odds and powerless than people in games, because um, we tend to feel like our uh, job is to uh, give fun and have fun, and that seems really strange to do now, right? It seems very strange to kind of be like, let's just have fun. Yeah, you know, um, but I, I actually um, super believe in play as a force of change um, and play as a way for us to kind of work things out um, as a culture. Um, and so I've been thinking about um, furthering my work and having people and players start to use like games for such purposes, right? Um, so we'll discuss a little bit about that, you know, kind of uh, my journey in doing it and such. Um, I mostly just have gifts. There's not going to be anything super important, pertinent up there, but um, you know, we're visual culture now, I guess. So I figured. So um, I'll just kind of go through a little bit. Um, is this going to work? Let's see. Go, and then go. No. Okay. Technology. Here we are. Next. Okay, cool. That works. Now you can look at my wonderful gifts that I have. Um, so just a little bit of an overview of just my work, um, uh, especially how it pertains to intimacy, since that's kind of uh, the chat, uh, the topic of this chat. Um, so I originally started out as um, a games critic. Um, I wrote, um, you know, the usual sort of like game reviews and uh, media criticism and such like that. Um, but in particular, um, I remember having this column about dating sims when I was first starting out. I wanna, I wanna kind of call. I think it was called Love Interest, if I'm not, if I'm not um, mistaken. And what I decided to do was, um, I would go through a bunch of, um, yeah, please just pull up a chair. Uh, we're just making this a little bit more discussion style. Um, I, I went, when I started out, um, I. I decided to uh, uh, that I was most interested at the time about like romance and games. I always felt like there was something, especially when I started writing was what 2011, and so in 2011, like we were just starting getting to, used to the idea of like dating being like a large part of our gaming experience, um, and also um, that was around the time of the resurgence of the visual novel and the dating sim that were starting to become a little bit more prevalent. So I made a column about the boys I dated in dating sims and kind of just the really strange things that they kind of represented about culture, particularly about masculinity, um, because they usually were from Japan, but sometimes they were um, Western, Western made. Um, and I found um, some interesting ideas about identity construction through dating in games. Um, so th that's there. Um, and then I would say my next step in this was uh, I was involved with um, DIY game making. So game making with tools that don't require programming. Um, and I kind of started out um, with the idea of games being sort of like love letters. Like what does it mean to send a game like a love letter? Um, can a game be a love letter? And not like a love letter to Zelda or something, but like, you know, like kind of like um, an intimate note to a close per a close friend. Um, and I started to think about, about that. Um, uh, so my first game was for my best friend and kind of like a, a chat. I, I also um, made a game when I was living in San Francisco for my ex-partner, um, about um, struggling to uh, struggling to eat, um, he 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 was a type who kind of did not have to uh, pull out loans for college and doesn't have a credit card, and he was he was very mystified by my extremely indebted existence, um, and so I tried to make this game to kind of show how like I had to negotiate a lot of things, um, which he did not play, so we like broke up. 
Um, and then I started to kind of get into like community events, um, which maybe is not considered intimacy um, right away, but around the time that we started, so like 2013 was the first Gamer X. Um, it was also the first um, Queerness in Games conference, which I founded. Um, and that was also the first different games, if I'm not mistaken. So it was like a, a year of community starting to become a little bit more solidified. Now people kind of like take for granted the fact that you can go to an event that cares about like queer people, people of color or whatever. In 2013, like before then, it, like they just didn't exist, right? So at that time though, um, it was just so clear how much it mattered for people to gather um, as a community to form new networks. Um, and I think I stayed in community uh, organizing for the past four or so years because of seeing that sort of magic. And I'm sure people still come to events like this, particularly for the three I'm, you know, I'm seeing and talking to people who have gone to every single like gamer ads every year. So um, it's worthwhile. Um, so I kind of want to talk a little bit about um, the games industry track record with intimacy or talking about intimacy. Um, so as I kind of um, I, I start, I kind of intimated before, a lot of the game industry, especially at the time I started writing about games, believed that games were just inherently bad at intimacy. Like you just could not make a good video game that was about like love, sex, dating, or whatever. Um, uh, I think there was like a couple of reasons for this. The first was kind of player agency, right? Like games are, you know, like uh, tend to really value player agency, and players sometimes don't do cool things in games, um, and often play testing data shows that players want things that may look kind of sketchy in real life. Um, and so when you pair that, like player agency with um, intimacy, you start to kind of get like very strange, very strange um, a consumer material. So like, you know, I mean like Le Leisure Suit Larry definitely had multiple installations and I don't believe that's because there was one person who was bankrolling that entire venture, you know? Um, uh, I, I, feel, I, I think about um, all the different like weird things that you see in like modding culture. Like um, if you see like some games that have like dating romance options um, in games, uh, you'll see like mods for like skin lightning and all these other wonderful uh, things. Um, and it's clear that in the early days of when like maybe, like maybe, you know, I think we all remember around the time when like, you know, Bioware started to just release like Mass Effect and Dragon Age and everyone was like, oh my gosh, like I can date people and this is great. Um, and then the kind of weird kind of backlash to kind of what does it mean to date whom and identities. And there is also just the weirdness of kind of like choice architecture. Sorry, that's a little bit of like a designery thing to say, but like the ways in which people make choices. So for instance, like when you're dating, when you're in like dating sims, right? Like if you, especially early Otome, which is like um, uh, dating sims for aimed at women, um, especially in um, Otome games, what you decided to wear, like really influence which guy you would date. It was, it was very strange. Um, and there would always become like this point where, you know, like a threshold beyond all, like no return in which you're committed to one option, right? All of a sudden, everyone else is not interested in you and the, the guy you're pursuing is kind of like considering marriage, right? It's like a really sudden shift. And that's like very unnatural. I mean, I, I'm sure it happens in real life every once in a while, but like it, we, t we tend to have a lot more ambition ambiguous, you know, relationships tend to be a little bit more ambiguous in how they form, right? Um, gay, like, you know, the way relationships work in games is way too clear cut, right? It's just way too simple. Um, and especially queer people, believe, you know, know this even stronger, right? Like, you know, I'm sure many of us, I'm, I'm gonna like make a, a ballpark assessment that you all are around my age, that um, you lived in a time in which you really had to set, think like, is this person queer or not? And I don't know. And then where are all the little signals I have to do to kind of find out? And then like, you know, even then, right? That like does not exist in, in games, as like for the, you know, especially in the early times when it comes to larger budget games. Um, so I'm kind of interested in exploring intimacy outside of those, of that realm. 
Um, and I find when I, when I look at what is considered, like when we talk about intimacy in games, um, what is it that we actually look at? And we tend to look at the kind of player to player connections um, or the sort of um, people, who are the people we play with? tends to be the stories of intimacy in games. So um, when people talk about the power of games, it's usually like, oh, I had like this, you know, like MMO guild and who I'm like super close with and they, you know, have been with me through troubled times. Or they'll talk about like a family member who like, you know, was distant from them, but like connected through games or things like that. Like intimacy in games tends to be through the people that we play with as opposed to maybe the, the thing itself that we play with. Um, but, um, and so if we kind of know that, this, uh, that, that intimacy and games and maybe this connection between these two things, um, I'm sorry, I have to grab my tea before I lose my voice. Mm -mm. Uh, if we think about, um, you know, that the fact that intimacy has come between like player relations, um, we should start to consider other forms of networks as places for intervention with games. Um, and I'm talking about things like Twitter, right? Um, so Twitter, like, is so, or all social media or all tech platforms are designed, right? They're designed, they're, they're technology, they're interactive technology. And it's not too hard to start to view uh, Twitter as a game, and a game that we all play, um, and how we all engage with it, and how the choices that we make, and the things that we expect from it. Um, we can also look at things like Tinder, or maybe more appropriately here, Grindr. Um, as they, uh, liter uh, before, if I'm not mistaken, I, I know I'm not mistaken. So until about, I want to say, when did I move from San Francisco? Until about like 2015, um, you know how like when you are on Tinder and you're swiping, and um, you know you match with someone, and you can choose to either keep swiping or message them. You know that sort of screen. Tinder used to say have as not the message option, but the continue option was keep playing. It used to be that. It's not that anymore. I noticed the switch when it happened, but um, it used to say keep playing. And so it was this is this idea that that we are in these design systems, um, and a lot of the issues that we get on our social networks are because of design systems. So you know if you've ever seen that something which is like not fun, or you know the idea of an unbalanced game, you know, we know about that, right? Like rogues are OP, it's unbalanced, right? So that means like that, 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 that is kind of an expression of the designer um, having not fulfilled what one might call an elegant design, right? And we can also lodge that critique to, to something like to uh, something like Twitter or something like Tinder. And so right now, um, if you're up on you know, social media happenings and the fact that t uh, Twitter just cannot get rid of Nazis off of its platform for some strange reason, we know that it's not simply because someone at uh, Twitter is bad, but rather there's a fundamental design problem that we're picking up as players of this game, right? Um, so here we go. So, I feel like I've noticed over my time as a, as a journalist and as a designer and as a community organizers how much our social media platforms are, are training us to become more passive. Um, and I feel like they be, it, it trains us to become more passive because it wants us to be actively voyeuristic. Um, so we are, in, a, in effect, doing something we are, we are looking at others, and we are participating in this social game that is social media. Um, but is there anybody else who looks at social media and gets tired after seeing things that happen? Like, I remember distinctly a couple of days ago um, when there was even more, you know, sexual harassment accusations in the world, and also... Um, what was the other? There was some other awful thing that was happening in the world. And I just remember I was like getting out of bed. I read it. And I just promptly like just went right back to bed. I was like, I'm not here right now. You know, like I'm staying in my bed. And I can't help but feel like that is not, it. you know, even if it's not intended, it is a product of that design. It's a product of social media. Um, and that now like all we can do is stare at the screen and maybe feel involved by watching 
Um, and of course, you know, these sorts of platforms are motivated by us just watching via ads and such. And I feel like because of that, we now see action as something only like the rich and powerful can do. Um, this is something that maybe like celebrities have an influence of or that platforms or companies can change. Um, I, 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 I think that like now that things seem so large and pervasive, we feel our own individual actions are not worth it or they don't do anything. So like, has anybody ever like, you know, witnessed a conversation or felt when, like kind of like maybe like a canvas or we have a lot of canvas saying like, uh, you know, on the streets in New York that is like, what are you doing to solve like sex trafficking? I'm like, well, Jesus, I don't know. Like, I mean, I don't want sex trafficking to happen, but like, uh, I mean, I don't know. And of course, usually the thing is like donate money or whatever, right? But um, I am very staunchly against money being the only way in which one um, feels like they're doing good in the world. Um, and so I feel like we, we, through platforms like social media, we start to feel like we cannot actually connect our own energies to what is going on, going on with the issues that affect us. Um, and so I'm kind of, curious about this perspective of games and, and platforms as being this in to maybe changing that, like changing our relationship to problems. Um, if right now social media makes us feel like problems are just way too large for us to even grapple with, then what is it that we need to do besides change platforms or change our relationship to platforms um, to start feeling differently? Um, and I know, like, <laughs> as I just said, like, it feels like everything is just a large trash fire and he just, you know, safety says, you know, like roll away, like get away from it, right? Um, and I, and, but I really do feel like games kind of stoke that sort of escapist like feelings in us. Like it's really easy to be like, you know what? I'm opting out of this right now. I'm just like, I'm turning away. And I understand that like, you know, self care, but I think self care is now as a kind of buzzword is being used to for ignore or to kind of detach. And I feel like now we've all just have become detached, even from each other, even from the people that we are connected to on social media. And so I kind of want to rethink those sorts of things. And I and I and in in a in a way, um we we should see these designed platforms and technologies as also designing us. Um, they're designing us to behave a certain way. Like, I always like to give the example of, does everyone remember the first time that they felt like a ghost vibrate from a cell phone that wasn't being called? Like, I remember the first time that happened and I freaked out. I was like, oh my God, like I am obviously being changed. Like I'm obviously being changed by technology. And there's, lot, there's lots more, like more subtle things, but that's just the most clear that everyone kind of empathizes with, right? The fact that now we get phantom spasms from technology, like, like think about that, right? Um, so, so does so technology uh, design our design networks are designing us, and we should also, you know, as a side note, understand how our games also designing us. Um, that's a topic for another time, but you should consider it as like aware consumers. And now I think that offline networking is now being is now being influenced by online networking, and to consider. What is our relationship with our offline networks? How are they being shaped by our online ones? How much, how, how, like, how much, uh, how strengthened or weakened have they been from maybe the influence of something like, like Twitter or Tinder? Um, so I just, just a couple of like anecdotal like stuff coming from someone who has done research um, is that during the election, um, we've noticed through research that social networks have homogenized groups of people. So it means whether it's on your side or not your side, um, the kind of news that you get, the kind of search results that you get, the kind of people that you see recommended to you, the kind of tweets you see, everything is based on a sort of confirmation bias of like, what is it will you enjoy? What is it that you will engage with? And that is kind of fed back to you and people who are similar to you. And social media has a very, you know, interesting way of making us feel like we're seeing everything, even though we are definitely not, you know. Uh, two people uh, are seeing completely different things based on, you know, their data. Um, and I feel like this is starting to reinforce offline tendencies for people to stick with those who are closest to their identity. Um, this is a known, like, in-grouping, out-grouping 
you know, thing is, you know, uh, not, not really a surprise. Um, people who are uh, who, like in relationships tend to want to be in relationships with those who are most similar to them, usually on a racial, religious, and class background. Um, and so I can't help but feel that when everyone was super shocked about Trump winning the election, that most people who didn't were so cloistered away from other people to have no idea. Here in New York, I mean, I work at, um, at the New School and at NYU, and at NYU, I witnessed literal like cry circles like the day after. And I, I mean, yeah, everyone should cry, but like these were definitely like privileged white people who were having cry circles, you know? Um, and to me, maybe because I come from a place that was more politically um, mixed, I'm from Florida. I'm also still registered in Florida because it's way more useful. Um, but there, like, you're not surprised when, when a vote goes either way or is very strange. Um, but I feel like when I lived in California and New York, people were so held into these very small bubbles that these sorts of things are surprised. And I feel like this is also true for things like beauty um, and how power works through beauty to shape our networks. Um, and that um, what I kind of have been coining sort of like uh, care networks, like who gets access to care, who gets access to intimacy, um, that is also structured by power. And I feel like we're starting to reveal how much um, our, our technology that is designing us is also designing who gets access to care and emotional intimacy. So I'm trying to like empower people to, I wanna, well, what I wanna do is I kinda wanna like kinda toss people out of their own bubbles. You know, I wanna get people to move from what is this comfortable, self-fulfilling prophecy of ad companies that are basically shaping our entire online existence to trying to reach outside of these gaps. Um, I, in particular, I want to aim people who don't have resources with people who do. And often we kind of see this relationship as, hey, affluent people give like poor people money, but we already have that system in place and it doesn't work, right? It's like people just, you know, there are people who hoard money and don't give it. It's just how that, you know, that's, so that, that, that sort of, that sort of uh, appeal is not, does not work. And you, you find that is because um, everyone who needs resources are kind of like a blank, faceless figure because they don't exist within the care networks of those people who are, have access to resources. So uh, I've met many people in my lifetime who have never uh, been, uh, have had, had like a black close friend haven't had a trans close friend, like all these types of people are kind of imagined, not imaginary, but creatively imagined by a person. And if I find that, uh, you know, that people tend to have a hard time connecting with other people's issues when they actually can't feel it. And if, and you know, like the, mo you know, like whenever some sort of tragedy happens, someone always says, imagine this happened to your daughter. Or imagine if it happened to your whatever, right? Or someone will say, I have a daughter and therefore sexual abuse really hits home to me, right? It's kind of, it, that's like a, it's like a crappy mentality, but it's how we work. Like we imagine a person we actually care about suffering and then we suffer too, right? And so then it, then it makes sense that we need to kind of diversify, if you will, our care networks because we're not gonna have, you know, a connection to a, uh, all these different um, problems if we just don't care about those people. And we can intellectually care about those people. We can kind of hypothetically care about these people. But like if you have to kind of logically get there, you obviously don't feel it, right? Um, so uh, I, I, but at the same time, I definitely don't want this to be a sort of designery, like, you know, uh, top down sort of initiative. like. I, I think that there's um, a lot more success to be in, to, to be had in kind of collaborative efforts, and also for collaborative design. So not just like consumers and gamers waiting for some game to come save us all, which I feel like is kind of implied, to be quite honest. I feel like every like for the, in the past decade, people have been waiting for a game that changes everything, you know, which is I think stupid. Sorry. 
Um, but we can, we, there are, right, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah, let's, <laughs> yeah, we, we don't want to go there just yet. Um, but yeah, so I don't believe that there is, but I do believe in a power up in, in play, and there are, there are some precedents. So some common precedents that you might hear in some like design circles are like the new games movement in the 70s by like people like Bernie DeCoven. So like, you know, like in kindergarten when you like played with like a giant parachute with a bean. So that was actually a game that was invented in the 70s um, as a political sort of game that lost its context and now it's just a kindergarten game. But um, at, a, at some point, the idea of public play was considered very radical in the 70s um, and used to kind of bring people together. Um, and what's interesting about, I mean, I have a lot of uh, personal issues with Bernie DeCoven, but one thing that is interesting is that his work is about um, a kind of a player manifesto as opposed to like a, des like a designer's manifesto or a consumer's manifesto. It's more like how can you use game playing to be a, a point of power for you in a community? Um, and so I recommend looking at uh, this, if anybody wants it, uh, it's called The Well-Played Game by Bernie DeCoven. And it's really, um, it's a mixed bag for me personally, uh, but lots of lots of people really like it, and it's and I think it's interesting because it's a it's one of the few books that are from and about the player's perspective and what the player's agency is in games, as opposed to um, what is it a designer can do for other people. There's also uh, what uh, in my research in 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 kind of. Um, games academia sort of is the idea of like the infinite game which is by um religious scholar uh i think jp Kars. um and it's this idea of like games and uh, life itself being a game like this long game that we're all playing and the main move of this game is to continue it um and it it's interesting because um often we see games as something separate from life, like something that is for playtime and for leisure and not something that affects our daily, our day-to-day -day business. But in this perspective, we start to see that the moves we make in relation to other people start to become um, a realm of possibility of action. And if we consider that in pairing with the well play game and sort of like play our manifesto, we can start to see what are the moves we make in life in the sort of like playful back and forth that we can do. Um, then we can start seeing things like, like gender as a, a system that needs balancing if one wants to take that sort of perspective. Um, and I think uh, when, one thing that like, let's say queerness, since this is GamerX, has something to offer and is usually um, a constant part of queerness is the idea of um, always looking towards like this utopia that's in the future, this idea of um, a day in the future will be better and we will construct it um, through action, usually through our bodies, right? Um, often through like our appearance, um, our love, um, our action. I think that um, there's like kind of no better place to start that than within like kind of queer movements, especially queer play movements. Um, and hmm, I, I want to phrase this correctly. Uh, so it's not exactly about playing well or better or good games, really. It's more about um, practicing practicing preferred futures, like play, like kind of like can we role play a future we want, if you will. Um, is, is there, is there, because in a way, um, by acting it out in real life, it kind of becomes real. Um, I, I had this um, great conversation with a local NYC game maker, Christian Howard, about um, lying and about um, how queer people have a very special relationship to lying, you know, and about how lying in a way um, acted as um, an attempt for us to change reality, if you will. And how lying is how we created uh, cer certain spaces to move in. So there are spaces in which you lied on purpose for safety, and there are places in which truth was unabashed, right? 
And I kind of think of play as a little bit of a lie too, right? Play it does not follow life's rules very often, right? Like often when a child comes up to you and says, let's play a game, they want to invent some very strange thing for you to do that you would not normally do. But in that second, you're kind of creating this like internal like lie that reality that, that is passing as reality for at least a second. And I start to think that eventually those lies start to become real. Um, I think of, um, I just kind of give like an example of what that might be. Um, ha, um, how about like, um, you know, like memes in general, right? Memes start out very like ironic. Like obviously people do not talk in such a way or believe something is true. There's irony there. But eventually the irony starts to leave. Has anybody like caught themselves like saying something mimetic in like real life when they really should not? Like it's like, I, I feel like I've said things in spoken time, in spoken word where I'm like, oh, I am now using that as an actual metaphor, not as an ironic signaling, right? Um, and so there's this way in which when we practice things, when we kind of practice things in a space uh, that is a, a first maybe safer or obviously um, constructed, eventually it seeps into our real real life. We can also consider fashion trends to be this way, right? A fashion trend has to start somewhere. And that person's in, at first that person's like, oh gosh, they're doing something very strange. Then it becomes normal, like the undercut. Like I'm pretty sure like three years ago, every single queer person I knew had a fucking undercut. And let me tell you, the first person who probably had an undercut, someone was like, that is a little weird. Why did you only shave one side of your head, right? Um, so I think that like we can consider practicing utopias, practicing futures, along these lines, like along the lines of let's start a weird fashion trend that has to deal with like living a better life. I don't know, we do it we, in, in other ways. So this kind of then means, and this is getting a little bit nerdy into my, into my background, is thinking of a sort of speculative design. Um, speculative design already exists. It's a very strange uh, like gallery product design in which, um, uh, people are uh, uh, designers kind of make fictitious products for us to imagine like what kind of world do we live in so it would be kind of like um, you know robots that um, can't really locomote on their own and they must be carried around like children in order for them to actually um, do their function and it's kind of like this speculative idea of what happens if we actually were forced to forge you know uh, emotional connection or, or, or to our, our appliances, right? It makes us imagine like, what, how would we act in such a world? Um, but there's very, uh, you, one might say that there's very little speculative game design practice of this idea of like less imagined future um, that in which we hug robots. Um, but um, if people are familiar with like LARPing in general, LARPing starts to kind of blur that, right? There's some LARPs in which if you're looking from the outside, you might not know it's a LARP. Um, this is particularly true for uh, Nordic LARPs. If anybody does not know about Nordic LARPs, whenever I reference Nordic LARPs to people who are not in games, I get the most like weird looks. Like, how can this possibly be real? But Nordic LARP is essentially LARPs that are done in Nordic countries, but they tend to kind of be um, uh, um, extremely, uh, they tend to kind of role play uh, like historical events or really intense uh, subject matter. Um, and America, there's American LARP that is also influenced by it, but again, it's one of those where they, they, they have a, pro, a common factor if anybody who does LARP knows about like uh, bleed and the idea of emotions that come from games and real life that kind of mix with one another. Uh, Nordic LARP very often deals with this idea of bleed, of a game that kind of can affect you so strongly it leaves you the game with you. Um, and I feel like that is kind of like a good start. Uh, so I would look up Nordic LARP. There's, there's LARPs in where people have um, gone and tried out different gender and sexuality paradigms that are completely alien to humans um, for like two weeks. So like this like strange commune of the, the I believe the genders were um, morning people and evening people. Um, and those were the genders and how one was attracted to other people was De decided by what morning people liked and evening people like, and it was just this interesting way. And when people will, will, they actually kind of like train themselves to live in this kind of play society for a couple of weeks because I know Nordic people live in socialist states, so they can kind of just have two weeks off whenever they want. Sorry, is that a question? Uh, yeah, sorry. 
No, it's fine. Go ahead. Mm. Full on, like get, get in trouble right. and go out right. and perform. Mm -hmm. um, and then it seems very similar to like, mm -hmm. usually, like for the next couple of days, we're right. going to have Right. <laughs> like, yeah, I, um, I have, I think, um, at least my research shows that. Um, um, these sorts of things, I'm about to get to kind of like participatory design, um, actually matches um, the rise and fall of participatory art. Um, particularly, I'm gonna, maybe I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. I think this is, yeah, cool. Here's my obligatory lesbian uh, gif. Um, so participatory design was um, uh, made in Nordic countries in the 70s, around the time when participatory art was very high. It was at its peak. And basically it's a sort of design that involves end users at the time. It was like for tech, for basically when you wanted to design for like tech, uh, for a kind of IT people, they would then get those people who are users and be like, can you just try this out? Or can you like give us ideas so we can start designing around? And then like neoliberalism came in the 80s and crushed everything. And then now we're starting to see a little bit more of a resurgence, both of like conceptual art, participatory art, zines, all that sort of kind of like, you know, it was kind of tried in the 90s and kind of faded in the Oz and now it's kind of back again. Um, I feel like um, this sort of resurgence it has to do with our how much agency we feel like we have as people individually with the things that we interact with, I feel. I think in times in which um, authoritarianism is high and when a time of powerlessness is high out of, outside of like things like capital, I feel like people recede into that. And I feel like we are doing that now, right? We now live in an authoritarian state, right? And we're starting to recede because there feels like less and less power and able to move. Whereas um, I would say in the past, especially with uh, the games and play and the feeling of control and participation, uh, we start to get that. I would say in Nordic LARP's particular case, I think literally having free time, like the amount of free time you're allowed to have in like kind of socialist-esque countries is just way more than here. Like, um, so I think that has a lot to do with it, more like a safety net of being able to just do weird shit. Um, and, and you'll notice that people who do more weird shit here in this country have more of a social sa safety net. So I might have more pragmatic answers for that, um, but it's possible there's also a connection there too. We also draw from cultural symbols all the time. Um, and so, you know, um, I feel like our expressions here in America of what is it that we do to kind of express these sorts of things kind of go in line with our kind of past like artistic and political history. Um, but that's a good question. So. I can. I would think of maybe what we're talking about uh, as a little bit of like an early access to new culture, right? Like, how can we start to practice the new game in the future, or the game that we want, the games we want to play in culture? Um, and I think that that sort of participatory process, maybe that might need some sort of design expertise of some sort, but it's not centered around designers. It's centered around the people who will be living, right, or, or, be, or be going about this sort of new game or this new style of play. And so I, I, just, I very distinctly, even though I'm here and it's obviously you're all looking at me and I'm the authority, um, my ideas should not be alone. It should not, and it should not lord over other people's. Like we need to kind of learn how to not just see players' contributions as just um, um, uh, metric data. Uh, because I believe that the kind of player that comes out of metric data um, is kind of gross. It's like people who want things to revolve around them at other people's expense. It's people who want money to decide a lot of things. And it's those who want, um, you know, the will of the many to trample over the will of the few. And so I don't like the sort of player that comes out of typical game metrics and game data. Um, so I think that there needs to be a sort of other process. And despite my reservations of early access anything, um, I think this idea of us trying to 
um, pitch this sort of new future and practicing it in a public forum in which others could also participate in design is a fruitful metaphor for how uh, at least us in our particular situation as designers and game consumers can kind of access this. So what, I what is the kind of early access culture you will pitch, if you will? Um, so just a little bit, a little bit more about my work. Um, so I've been uh, switching over from just kind of like traditional game product design over to food um, and the eating ritual. Um, in particular, uh, and so actually something some people don't, might not know about me, um, before I was a game critic, I was actually trying to become a food critic um, and got weirdly derailed into games. It's a long story. But um, now I guess like my love of food and the eating with other people is starting to kind of creep back into my work. Um, and so what I, what, I've, what I started to kind of really realize is just, who are the people you eat with? And when you eat alone, why is it? I started to like really think about those sorts of things and started to see that usually we use eating with others as this sort of kind of call for intimacy with another person. Um, unless it's super intentional, you don't tend to want to eat with people you dislike right, in general. That sounds like the worst thing in the world, right? We all dread, maybe many of us are dreading Thanksgiving, right? Exactly, I already saw that, I already saw the reaction, right? So like we all, like, you know, the, I, eating is such, a, is a place in which intimacy can be formed or strengthened, right? And so I see the eating, the eating situation, which is like an academic way to kind of say it, um, is an interesting, site for us to kind of maybe start thinking about this sort of like speculative play. Um, and I'm thinking very particularly about the eating ritual, about the, how, what, what are sort of like the, the kind of um, formal qualities in which we eat, right? Um, we, there's a lot of us assumed things that we do that one might not think is up for grabs. So for instance, the utensils we use, the way we sit, Right? One of the things I actually really dislike about restaurants is sitting um, across from people. Like sometimes, like some situations, I really like that because eye gazing. But other times, like the 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 um like the like kind of like you know the pole in the middle of like the table gets in your way, and there's it feels like it's a distancing object. I find, and in some eat in some eating situations, being side by side is more intimate, or sharing is harder when you're across. Very often, especially when there's like clutter all over the place. Well, like I can imagine like a smaller, thinner table that's a little bit longer that makes more sense. Um, or you can just think about like how like weight service happens. Like weight service is very transactional; it's not very intimate. But I can imagine like what happens if we kind of put like you know I don't know. Once if your your therapist was uh, like more of like a, like in the act of like serving you food and being like you know what I think you all need like this sort of meal of what's going on with you all instead of this other thing that you think you need. Right? Um, there's a bunch of things I think in the daily act of eating. Maybe how you choose the food that you are going to cook, or maybe the style in which. Um, I love to host parties in which people bring different foods, and I don't know what exactly is going to happen. Um, as the weather gets cold, I do like mulled wine parties, and I ask people to kind of bring spices of their leanings, and then kind of you know have different kind of pots to kind of boil, and people just like kind of make it right. And it's a sort of sharing that is an expression of the group of people who is there, right? Um, and so uh, I, I, I'm, I really like to kind of pay attention to the ritual um, itself. Uh, rituals are actually have like a history within games uh, discourse or studies as being um, uh, basically indistinct from play. Like the oldest, you know, kind of, kind of white guy writer in the 30s basically said that play and rituals are formally indistinct. And so if we think about that, you know, if, if we think about a ritual, like what are the things that we commonly do when we wake up, right? Or what are the things we commonly do when we go to sleep? Or what are those sort of like actions that like in some part of your day, you kind of do like, aut like automatically, right? If you do yoga, you might, know, you might have like one particular like set that you do without even thinking, right? You just kind of move your body with it. Um, if you consider uh, its relationship to play, like rituals are very much like this sort of like weird set of rules that you just decided to arbitrarily do because you felt like it adds to your life in some way, right? Like every morning I wake up and have a cup of tea 
um, because it makes me feel a certain way, and I then read particular kinds of news um, in bed, in particular. Um, and then afterwards, I then do my shower, and then my shower goes into a very particular set of things. I first, like, you know, wash my face, and I do whatever, and it's just like an automatic thing in which I do, right? And we all have it, and it's a little bit comforting, right? Like, like we all kind of get a little bit of discomfort whenever we go to, like, a hotel, right? Like, like sleeping in a hotel sometimes is, like, the most, like, uncomfortable thing because like your your ritual gets like disrupted in a way right you can't like do these same exact things um and i feel like that is sort of a way um like a very um direct way to kind of influence life by creating rituals in which you share with other people right and the bond that you can kind of choose to uh to kind of have over that so you can even consider like like or or like kind of like um I don't know, like, look at any sort of a shared activity. I think about like exercise, right? Exercise, like when I like would get up in the morning and go running with a friend when I used to do that. Um, it would be this very particular thing of like, oh, I need to kind of wake myself up and I need to kind of, you know, get myself in these very particular kind of clothes that make me feel a particular kind of way. Then I kind of go with this person. And it was just very clear to me that like, ru like, like running with this friend was kind of a different kind of like therapy. Right, it was like it was me talking to this person, and for having a, a particular kind of experience. It doesn't even have to be running; it doesn't have to be exercise, but doing the kind of like this regular thing once a week with this one person was um, its own kind of us altering the fabric of reality, if you will. Right. Um, so, just kind of like a quick overview, since we have a, a little bit of time, I just want to kind of talk a little bit about projects I'm working on now. Um, I'm currently doing um, these sorts of uh, weird dinners for two, which have like these strange kind of playful instructions with them that have people doing um, doing things um, in them to kind of create a sort of like speculative intimacy with one another. Um, it's particularly trying to get like two strangers uh, to form a bond in which one would not exist if they were naturally allowed to kind of like choose whom they bond with, right? Um, and I kind of, I decided to kind of take the sort of creative process that um, artists and designers go through, which is kind of essential on the lines of like research, ideation, prototyping, um, et cetera, and kind of use those as kind of these little exercises or these games to kind of um, get people to start thinking about it. And it's sort of like this sort of fictional lie, right? If I was to kind of randomly put people together and just be like, okay, imagine this fake relationship you'd have with this other person. What would that be like? Like, let's just imagine it. Because right now, we don't do that exercise with people who are different from us, or at least enough degrees away from us. And this is particularly true of people who have access to resources with people who don't, right? Um, bless you. And so one of the first things that I'm doing is that I get people to kind of like fill out surveys of like their favorite foods. And I start to match people based on um, how I feel like their ingredients that they kind of talk about match each other or complement or actually contrast each other. Um, and the first dinner, and I'm starting to like prototype these right now, so I don't have pictures of them, I'm sorry. Um, but I kind of get people to like look at the ingredients of the meal that's about to be made, and I have them like smell them, you know, kind of take them in, remember the last time they've eaten them, and give stories and feelings and values to each of the food. First of all, I feel like we don't sit down with our food very often, and in this like excruciating detail, and like value value it. Like um, the more I kind of think about how involved I am with, I want to be with food in like a kind of intellectual interest way, the more I just really want to just savor it. I don't want to like rush. And then I'm, what I do is I get uh, people to kind of blend things together and make meals that kind of represent the energy of them. So one of the first design exercises I do is I get like a bunch of like these sort of spices and I get people to kind of recount feelings that they have with them. And then I let them collaboratively choose things to go into a spice blend that's going to like represent their relationship. And then I kind of use that because I'm cooking throughout this because I'm a chef. Like that weird chef therapist is kind of what I am. Uh, I didn't, <laughs> it's really, it's kind of, it's, it's a little like kind of strange, but I kind of like it. Um, and then I would blend it and then use it to kind of season their food to kind of internalize, like kind of, and give like, like, because we talk about the, these things like play and justice and like relationships, and those are very vague 
they're conceptual. They have very few like sensory outputs. Or sorry, outputs is not the way I meant to say that. Um, sensory um, signifiers, like ways in which like, what does it feel? Like there's like this maybe vague internal notion of it. And I find it really interesting when we can locate those things in, in, with the body. Um, and I think that when we, um, when we do that, we can kind of maybe play with it, play with it a little bit more. So one can kind of see food as game pieces, if you will, and how I, as a designer, use different game these different game pieces to get people to feel different things and take it with them outside of the experience. Um, let's see. So. I guess, as I kind of mentioned before, the, the point of these sorts of exercises is to get people to kind of uncover the power dynamics within relationships. Because it's not very often when you're about to, you know, you, you kind of met a new cutie and you're kind of like, hey, like we're vibing on each other. You don't kind of stop and be like, okay, we need to kind of like discuss like power dynamics and like racism and like every, you know, like it tends to like not be the time, but in all honesty, it is the time. Right, it is. It's actually the thing that one should do, but there we don't really have like that analog. Like you know, like mom didn't really prepare me to talk about racism with my romantic partners, right? Like it's something that needs to kind of be learned and practiced, or other things like economic power, or you know, like disability, or all these other things, which just feels like. I mean, some of us have had to have that conversation. Like, and if you have any trans friends, like the conversation of like, hey, do you know about this? You know, quality about me is a thing that like some people are used to, but um, I wonder if we can kind of maybe take power of that conversation as opposed to feel like a like kind of forced to have that conversation or be victimized by it. Um, and I think that when we do do these kind of like weird games or like my weird like food ritual stuff, uh, it makes that weird maybe separate place that you can start to practice these qualities and they kind of accidentally start showing up in real life because you're just so used to it, right? Like, have you ever like kind of had like a joke, like an in-joke with someone that you say over and over with them and then you kind of make it outside of that context and you're like, oh wait, like why did I, why did I do that? Or, or some sort of habit that you do in a particular context that just seeps out afterwards? Like this is the sort of thing I'm talking about. Like maybe like, like kind of training ourselves and other people to have these sorts of habits that eventually leak out into real life. Um, and I kind of, so, as a sort of like manifesto of sorts. Like I want this to empower people to form intentional communities. Like I want, instead of us like accepting life and the people we're connected to as inevitable, right? I think there's this powerlessness of like, who is it that we're attracted to? Who is it that we feel friendly to? Who is it that cares about us? Feels like some sort of like weird fatalistic aspect of the universe. But I feel like we can actually intentionally form these communities as opposed to feel obligated to be around others because they may share an identity. And I want uh, the powerless to give the powerless the ability to kind of transform a lack of support into like a more vibrant ethical network. Right? So we think of networking as the kind of like necessary evil that we do for our jobs, but we don't often think about maybe the necessary networking we need to do for our emotional lives, right? Um, and I think that, that that sort of intentional support structure uh, crafting is an important skill and also something that we kind of shun. Like we kind of shun intentionally crafting friend groups or um, emotional groups because it feels like either manipulative or, or unnatural. But I feel like at this time when we know that our natural tendencies is to stick with people that we know and are used to us and actually kind of rob us of diversity and you know, access to different experiences, we can see that, that there, there's some issues with it. So um, none of this obviously is like clear or easy. This is obviously like a very like conceptual thing that I'm telling you. I like this gift too. Um, Echo the dolphins like in forever now. Um, but I really, um, I'm giving this to you all a little bit like abstractly because I'm trying to not fill in your imagination with mine. Um, and I think that's a really important thing. Like I think we all do want to um, kind of have an, like, an authority figure tell us things. Like how do I just make things right? And I think there's a lot of us who are like, just tell me what to do to do it right and I will do it. But I think that like, you know, even in the, mo in the most pleasant, you know, well-meaning, like, you know, um, station, I think that someone telling other people to do just robs people of their own creativity. And I think there's nothing more that we need now is for us to kind of exercise our creativity in a time in which 
us going on autopilot has landed us into like Nazi land, right? Like it, like this, where we are at now is not because of, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a glo it's a kind of a, a global thing. Like it didn't just happen because some people are awful. It also happened because a lot of us are passive and not imagining. Um, and so I kind of want people to take this and kind of morph it into whatever way makes the most sense um, to them and their communities. Um, and I, I feel like you shouldn't expect things to be easy. I mean, I, I, I think about when we all believe, like think about who are the like heroes that either we look up to or the people who have changed things, a lot of it is through kind of like hardship. And I think that you should just be very intentional about how much hardship you should take and just understand, are you taking enough if you're in a position of advantage? And if you're taking too much, if you're in a position of disadvantage, right? Um, I think it goes both ways. I think um, some people uh, take on too much because it feels right, but it isn't necessarily so. Sometimes you have to be strategic about the hardship that you take on. Um, and, I, and we often talk about being diverse, but I feel like this often stays in the realm of representation of just like, let's represent a diverse amount of people. But I honestly believe that um, diversity is more about ex the, the experiences and things you feel, like the experiences you have. Um, and I think that if you are surrounded by homogeneity, um, you won't have it. Um, if it's not like central to your life and to your character. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of my hour long monologue. Um, we do have, I think, a few more minutes for either questions or responses or other things, if you all have any. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, obviously, as a therapist, that's a concern. Yeah, super troubling. So, um, that was something that drew me into this. For sure. Idea. Yeah. Um, and so, I guess I see it um, from like this other lens of like maybe the vision gone too far. Right. Um, I think something you bring something up that's very important, actually, super relevant to queer people, is, um, and also other people, but since we're in this context, um, the people in your support network should not just be the people that you make out with and fuck, please. You know, like is something that queer people have a problem with is that the people whom which we draw support from are the people we're romantically or sexually connected to. Um, and I think we have something to learn um, uh, from other social minorities about intimacy is not just like, is not just like sexual and and romantic in the narrow way that we think about romance. It's also about like a, a varying amount of things. Like I honestly do believe we should live in a world in which romantic, sexual, friendly, and uh, familial intimacies are kind of equal in importance and take up equal amount of times in our lives. Um, and I think that this should also apply this uh, this intentional this intentional um, relationship crafting should be applied to all sorts of intimacies. So first, a boundary setting of my romantic part and sexual partner should not occupy my entire life. And also, um, I need to um, maybe further value the ways in which non-sexual and non-romantic people have in my life. Because, you know, obviously kind of like the dark timeline of my, my um, what things I'm saying is, everyone must be sexually and romantically available to everyone and I'm going to enforce it. And obviously that's like just like not a thing I think is possible right now. But what we can do is start to value other people more than we currently do. So I hear that and I totally speak. So yeah, I will, I will always say that loud and clear that I feel in particularly in queer groups to kind of really 
um, have a stronger emotional network outside of the people that you uh, sleep in, with and are romantic with. Um, other kind of comments or stuff? Yeah. I feel like, I don't know, like, if this relates to it. Cause That's fine. Something you said, like, struck me. And, like, from the moment that I started, like, intentionally making relationships, like, that's been, like, such an awesome thing. And, like, thinking very consciously about what I want from relationships mm -hmm. and, like, communicating that. Like, even now, like, I use, like, OkCupid and I have, like, it's just, like, super clear. Like, I'm looking for two categories of people, like, emotional right. intimacy, physical intimacy, and, like, even though that comes with it, but, like, mm -hmm. it's still really good for me to know, like, <coughs> what types of relationships I'm looking for, what kinds of intimacy I'm looking to create, and I think it came from having bad coping mechanisms for sure. with certain groups of friends, because mm -hmm. they were, like, the only queer people I knew. Right, for sure. So, like, learning from that, and, and I don't know, realizing that I need to be more aware of, like, how right. I'm building relationships in community. Right. I, I feel like uh, what's something that's super interesting now is kind of, like, we're in this weird paradigm of, like, the internet shows that, like, we are completely there's so many options of people to connect with but also that we shouldn't have too high of standards or else like we're like kind of kind of not obeying our social standing a bit um and i have found that the moment i started being extremely clear about all of my boundaries and expectations like one like the less trash i received in general and the even though i got fewer people talking to me the more they felt like closer to the point of what i wanted in life and I think that maybe it's because we're all unused to the idea of being very clear about our intentions and being, uh, we're unused to the idea of having like these very intentional relationship crafting techniques. And so it scares a lot of people. It makes you think that it makes you come off as if you're like way too serious or way too whatever. But um, I would say a utopia of mine would be where this idea of approaching each other and being very intentional about what one wants um, and crafting that a unique set of intentions together becomes more normative. And maybe that like these sorts of practices of being upfront about that, about saying that this is what we're gonna do, maybe that will start to kind of influence others. Because I mean, I got the idea from somewhere, you got the idea from somewhere, you know, some somewhere gave us that idea to do something like that. So maybe if more of us start to kind of model that, yeah. And I feel like it's something that's very specific to like queer people maybe, because mm -hmm. like, Right. I feel like I feel like the, the easiest answer to that is people who are forced to live outside of like norm normative stuff kind of encounter alternatives yeah. much more frequently. Yeah. And so I definitely still find like many queer people who have like bad ideas about boundaries, but um I would say that um you know, things that become that are all alternative and are successful become mainstream, and you can decide how useful or not useful that is. You know, in this, I, I think a relationship intentionality is a good thing to maybe start to kind of bring from the alternative to the mainstream, and it kind of is starting to happen. Um, and I do think that's what maybe a power of maybe starting from a queer space is, is like um, we can start to model this um, so it starts to leak outside of our, out of our community, right? And maybe right now it's not as formalized or maybe it seems more intuitive now, but maybe if we do kind of practice it in, in, in a way that seems approachable to others, if we can just work that out, I think that maybe we can start to, one, get more queer people to do it, you know, uh, more consistently, but also maybe have it be a more widespread thing. And then maybe within that, we start to kind of see the possibility for, um, these sorts of intimacies that are not common, right? Because if we just start to, if like, like with every person, we're like, hey, look, like we start, we're starting to hang out a lot. Like we should kind of like talk about what's about to happen. If that was like normal, that would be like, first of all, the world I want to live in. Cause I'm like, I'm like way too serious. I have no chill. Um, <laughs> but um, I can imagine like new sorts of relationships becoming things that we can't even imagine right now. Um, but now we just have to kind of model it and hope that it gets kind of, not hope, but like know that like trends happen. Imagine yeah, for sure. So I'm pretty sure I'm over time, but thank you all for joining me. Um, and yeah, let me know if y'all, feel free to reach out um, if you have any questions. Perfect. Mm -hmm.